Hi, it's Dr. Nils Hennesteer here. Oh, he of theme tune fame. And I'm calling to say that you're listening to The Bliss of the Abyss. Once upon a time in a land far away, a poor farmer and his wife lived all alone. They were very lonely. With Robert Newmark Jones. Hello, you're listening to another episode of The Bliss of the Abyss. My name is a collection of letters that, when placed from left to right, spells out the words Robert Newmark Jones or occasionally Ruskin Denmark. You, what is your name? We don't have time. You, what is your name? We simply don't have time. You, what is your name? We do not have the time. Welcome. Bit of a throwback there for everyone who uh, ever went to one of my comedy nights. Welcome in to the bliss of the abyss. This week on the show we have the inimitable, even though someone has his exact same name. <laughs> Only joking. Raul Coley, hilarious stand-up comedian from uh, the North East. So he's a Geordie. Can you do the Geordie accent? Why is it so hard to do? I can't do it. But he can. You know why? Because it's his normal accent. So he's just talking. And me and him do rather a lot of talking in this episode. This is a a really free-ranging chat. We cover so many different things, a a small drop of which is comedy. But um, having not really known Raul before we started recording, um, I quickly realised that we had just a ton in common in terms of things that we find interesting and things that we've read up on and um, want to know more about. So we're talking about a lot of evolutionary stuff, the the detrimental effects of social media, um, ballet dancers doing cyber security and um, the end of democracy, uh, as well as a lovely story about Paul Gascoigne. Um, That's all coming up on today's episode. Um, Thanks to Nils for that opening sting. That's an industry term. Um, If you have your own sting that you would like featured on TBOTA or Tabota, as it's sometimes been known, send it in. And if it's funny, I'll use it and you'll get paid just loads, just loads. (laughs) Um, Yeah, unfortunately, obviously, you will not get paid apart from in love. Because I don't have any money. And no, but neither does anybody else. So an extra special thank you to my patrons who, even in these trying times, are helping support me create original content and have fascinating conversations like my one today with Raul. Um, what can I tell you about myself before we jump into the episode? I am, as of this point in time, uh, seven days sober. <laughs> um yeah, you may hear me mention in this episode that I uh, got fat. <laughs> Anybody else got some COVID LBs? A couple of extra kgs? Um, I got up, up to above 13 stone, which for a man of my bone structure and height is unacceptable. So, yeah, according to this app, I've saved 114 quid already. So stuff that. I'm going to buy two bottles of Cristal and drink it all away. Um, so, yeah, a whole week without booze. And um, got to say, life has lost all meaning. <laughs> um, no, it's it's made much easier when your partner's doing it, isn't it? And you've got no money anyway. I'm definitely feeling the benefits uh, for sure. I'm, I am more productive but I am also still a procrastinator. So those things are kind of always going to be the case. But I do think that it was getting out of hand. Not not the booze so much as just the excess. You know, what, what's the phrase? Eat your feelings. I was eating my feelings, I was drinking my feelings, and all the rest of it. So, you know, got to stop eating pasta. That's, that's the only rule. <laughs> it's just, I eat everything else except pasta which is my favourite thing to eat. Damn. Curse you, pasta. 
I blame, for one, the parents. Um, <laughs> what else do you blame? Um, yeah, no, so um, uh, uh, our scale stopped working. And uh, you know how people just give me free stuff on the internet now? Uh, and by people, I mean weird Chinese companies. I'm sure they'll be held to pay. But if you've listened to this show, you know that for some reason I've been given some free things via the internet recently. And I, I think I've got to wean myself off of that boob because I'm sure the chickens will come home to roost somehow. Somehow. So I'm going to stop. OK, you, you heard it here first. No more. I'm not going to do it any more. But I did do it. Um, and one of the things that I got for free, for free, is a uh, bathroom scale, an electronic scale. Our old scale was completely fucked. It was done. So what we did is we got this new fancy scale that can measure your body fat, your BMI, um, your heartbeat, your uh, what else have we got? Your, your subcutaneous fat, your visceral fat, what percentage of your body is water, how much muscle mass you have, your protein, your body age, your BMI. Now, listen, I don't know quite how it does it. OK, I haven't looked into the science of it. You have to stand on it barefoot. It's got sensors. And my, my uh, vague scientific understanding is that it sends pulse, electronic pulses through your body. And I think that it's like... It's not the most exact scientific measurement, but it gives you some idea of some of these things. Um, so to give you some idea, my body age apparently is 34. Now that's winning because that's a year younger than the real age. My BMI is now just below high. I was overweight. It's now average approaching overweight. But hopefully it's on the way down. It, it's decreasing. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's all moving in the right direction. Being helped a lot by uh, the wonderful Mrs. Caitlin, um, who is is uh, is also losing weight with me and helping me. Um, and I'm not going to disclose any of her personal information because I'm a gentleman. But I will just say that the app, for some reason, says that her body age is 47 So it is difficult being uh, in the same house as a woman going through the menopause. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm there for her, you know, apart from in the times when she's having any kind of problems, in which case I am out of there, you know, because, you know, we've only got so many minutes in the day. How many minutes am I going to spend? Um, yeah, yeah, the app thinks, the app tells her she's 47. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the one with the, the wrinkles, the sunken face, the grey hairs. But no, Caitlin's... Caitlin's <laughs> I'm married to a 47-year-old. Oh, I shouldn't laugh, really, because I'm uh, fat and uh, dying. Um, uh, but for my scientific listeners out there, and uh, there's a lot of you, um, can you tell me what some of this means? My uh, my muscle mass is 135.2 pounds. That's out of the 182 pounds that I am. So that means a lot of me is just muscle, right? But but then my my fat is like 50 pounds. That can't be right, right? So 22% of my body is fat. Now that is terrible, isn't it? That doesn't sound good. It does not sound good. How did I get this way? In March, I was in the best shape of my life. I was performing on the West End. I was about to go on tour. What happened to me? And more specifically, to this part of me. <laughs> belly, 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 belly bounce. Belly bounce. Yeah, so um, I'm, uh, I'm fat shaming myself. No. <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm just trying to shed some of the excess because it's uh you know I'm all about being in balance here I'm not going to go fucking wild and become underweight but um you know you know what it's like some of you out there 
And for the others, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so that's my life. I'm living with a, uh, a 47-year-old. And um, what else can I say about that other than that it's great? It's absolutely great. And I, I bless, feel blessed every day. Uh, some exciting news for the podcast we've got a couple of um, very cool guests coming up soon Um, um, one of whom um, is Gaz from a band called Man and the Echo and I'm going to put a little clip of uh, Man and the Echo in just before we segue into this conversation with Roll so you can get a taste of what they're like and what's coming up they're a brilliant band they're an up and coming band but they're absolutely fantastic the lyrics are just spectacularly hilarious and on point and uh, I've seen them live once in the before times and they were just brilliant as well so enjoy this little clip from Man and the Echo um, Capable Man and um, and I'll see you on the other side of this chat with Roel alright I have successfully challenged parking fines with my persuasive rhetoric if a man with a van needs backing out, you better know that I'm on it. I drive my high performance family car with apparent joie de vivre. I am for small state, low tax, up by the bootstraps, I voted leave. I am a capable man. Capable, capable, capable. I am a capable man. Capable, capable. With water saved through various loyalty schemes We have two city breaks a year That's on top of the family holiday A fortnight in Gran Canaria I have insurance coming out my ass So no low life can touch me And I'm a hard working top performer at work Yeah, my bosses all love me But you just seem lost to me Raul Coley, welcome to the Bliss of the Abyss. How are you doing? I am okay. I am very tired, but that is that is nothing new <laughs> for me. Uh, early afternoon, uh, a struggle to sleep at night. It's a sort of side effect of having done comedy for eight years. But apart from that, I am well. <laughs> I you... say I'm good, but I'm, I'm I'm as good as you can be in these trying times. How in are the you? Abyss. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that's what we're trying to do with the show is uh, is not not spend too long flailing in the abyss. But seeing as we're starting there with some insomnia, because I am a fellow sufferer, um, what what do you do when it, when it comes on strong? Do you have any methods? Do you have all the methods? Uh, you know what? I'll be honest. I used to spend uh, for the most part of the past eight years, particularly after comedy, I used to smoke. Some pretty heavy spliffs, uh, and at first that used to do the job, sometimes it still did, but actually most of the time, uh, sometimes I didn't know what I was buying, I'd get a heavy sativa instead of an indica, if you're listening and you're not familiar with weed, sativa is the type of weed that wakes you up, uh, indica is the weed that puts you to sleep, and that, that would always be annoying, you know, I'd, I'd think, alright, okay, I'll smoke a spliff, that'll put me to bed, and instead I'd write my next Edinburgh show, uh, which was good in certain senses, but, but when you're trying to get to sleep, not quite what you're looking for. Uh, fortunately slash unfortunately for my sleeping schedule, I have knocked tobacco on the head by choice. Um, Good man. That, that does catch up with you. Uh, and, and to be honest, just given the times, I fucking run out of money. So I don't have any money <laughs> to buy weed. <laughs> so I've had to involuntarily knock that on the head as well. Um, so when it kicks in at the minute, I, I don't know. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling pretty bad. I mean, yesterday, you know, I'll try to read a bit on my yeah. phone, yeah. Um, and sometimes that can help. Sometimes I can really do the damage. Uh, I found when I was traveling, actually, it never was intentional, but every time I'd start writing my diary, I'd just collapse. I don't know if I'd just use that part of my brain. I think it was, you know, they say, like, you should count sheep. Yeah. I think I, I the what I learned, I think, from traveling was that every time I got to write my diary on a bus or something, like, by the second paragraph, I would just pass out. <laughs> And I think perhaps it's something to do with, like, I think, like, if you use that part of your brain well, the, hmm. the bit that conducts images. 
Um, that can sometimes like maybe wear you out or lead you to sleep or something. So I'd, I would recommend. Ooh, Jesus Christ! Sorry, I dropped something there. Uh, I would recommend that to people. But for me, I just try and read, uh, and then I listen to like a th- thirty minutes of a podcast or something. I've been listening to a lot of interviews with Andrew Yang at the minute. Uh, uh, yeah. That's as best I can do. Well, what about you? What do you do? Well, I've got a ton of techniques for sure. Um, one of the one of the hardest, but actually quite effective ones, is apparently if you've been trying to get to sleep for a while the best thing to do is just get out of the room for a bit change environment and it's awful because you're in bed and you just want to be asleep but you know it's not going to happen so you just like go to another room sit down have a cup of not caffeinated tea but something sort of soothing and then try again sort of like a reset um one of the other things i do is or i try and like control the light levels so that like as it's getting darker, I'll make sure there are no big bright lights on and I'll slowly sort of go down to a single light, which I then switch off. I think that can trick your brain with the, the melatonin production. Um, same with the blue light. So like the phone, if you've got the phone on, you have to make sure you're not consuming all of the blue light because then your body is like, ah, oh, time to be awake. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I learned that a long time ago regarding the light, uh, and that's why I went at night and my phone's always on zero brightness. But that's still, I don't know, at first glance, seems a little bit too light to me, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the night's nice meant to be the least light it possibly can be. That, that's a really good tip. I'm going to take that into account. And I think having done a bit of reading on the subject before and having suffered with this for a long time, uh, I think like, yeah, like changing scenery is probably a good idea as it's drinking a, a cup of, say, green tea or something. Yeah. Because for me, uh, I think that might be a big problem is that I do everything in my room. Do you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. my gym where mm-hmm. I work out at the minute. I, I live with shielded people, so I ain't going to no gym anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I study, you know, my laptop's here. It's where I watch TV. Uh, and it's probably not healthy to do all those things in the same room, just as it's probably not healthy to get your work office your day interest um, <laughs> and your emails from the, the same seven inch no. rectangle. I mean, yeah, but probably a different topic we could perhaps get onto later. Um, I, I actually also find some, I've really struggled to sleep if I've not eaten. Oh yeah. And I thought food was meant to, you know, wake you up cause it's energy. But if I've eaten, uh, I, I, if I'm, if I'm tired, and I'm not falling asleep, I usually find going downstairs and having a big sandwich with a glass of milk can usually do the trick. Mm, yeah, that, that sometimes works for me. But I, I think the downside of that is you'll get fat, um, which um, is something that's really happened for me over lockdown. I am literally the fattest man I've ever been. Um, <laughs> and I think if you eat late at night, it's like your body has to do all that work when you're asleep of digesting instead of giving it a break. Apparently that is... A surefire way, if you eat right before bed, to, to put on fat. However, uh, the gods have blessed me in, the, in that regard. Oh, yeah. Metabolism <laughs> has always been super quick. Uh, I've always been in fairly good shape uh, in that regard, at least looking in good shape, uh, particularly when I smoke cigarettes. God, internally, I was fucked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the outside, I, I, look re- I, I, I look okay. I, I don't have to worry about that but i think that's something i also do to make sure i, I try and this is also a fucking risk because you know depend on your work and stuff but I, i'll always try and go out and do some real heavy exercise yeah. at the minute i'm doing hill sprints some skipping yeah um and, and three more physical exercises whether that be legs abs and, and arms and i try and you know yeah definitely i built for movement our humans you know what yeah. once upon a time we spent most of our time just fucking trekking across the world from Africa all the way to the, the, the UK, through India, through Europe, etc., mm. etc. Like, that's what we did. We moved, we built things, we hunted, etc. We foraged before that, etc., etc., etc. We're not really used to particularly in lockdown this sort of static existence. And you're not really going to be tired mm. if you don't move like that, I think. So I really try and move during the day. But the risk of that is if you get very busy with work or something, and then at night you try and, you try and, you know, say, go for a run two, three hours before your bedtime, you could find that really kicks off your insomnia again. I know. I, I'm, it, it's, it, you were talking about weed earlier. It's the same for me. Like anything that used to make me tired is now the opposite. So like I've got to the point now where if I get 
lean, as the kids say. They probably don't even anymore. Um, I'll <laughs> I'll want to work out. I will go and you know get on the machine or lift some weights for ages, even though I'm. That's one of my favorite activities. Yeah. Isn't it the best? Yeah, working out and going to the gym. Uh, go, well, sorry, smoking weed and going to the gym. It's, it's yeah, I really like that. It's uh, just find it. I think it's something about weed that makes repetitive uh, actions mm. enjoyable. Yeah, uh, it just really makes repetition something to to crave. I suppose a hundred percent. Yeah, uh, something boring and and yeah, I just I fucking love it, man. The endorphins combined from the weed and the exercise, I find wonderful. It's it's a it's a strange thing because you, if you tell people who who don't smoke or don't really know about it they'll be like doesn't it give you the munchies doesn't it make you sleepy they've got all these strange preconceptions that are like probably holdovers from some smear campaign in the 50s do you know what i mean but yeah that and probably watching you know some fucking cliched 90s movie or some shit <laughs> yeah, like right. that uh 100 percent man i know i'm pretty fucking like i'm fucking active on that shit man i fucking I've been scuba diving high. I've oh, yes. Been, I climbed a mountain high. Uh, um, really, for me, I don't really... I mean, I suppose, actually, some, I'll be honest, when I mix it with tobacco, and I blame the tobacco more than anything, Good man. Um, it will make you stare at a wall. <laughs> that shit will make you really uh, non-active. But if you can, mind over matter, man, if you can override that, like I did, um, you will really fall in love with the combination of being high and doing things, and and that's why I cut tobacco out because I find like tobacco for me and uh, weed for me, sorry, they, they work against each other. Tobacco yeah. does it, it acts as a sort of opiate almost. It makes me just want to forget. It it just sort of numbs everything. But weed is an enhancer for me. Weed is something mm. that, as opposed to making me want to run away and escape from my life, is something that makes just every little thing a little bit better and just makes me just. It just enhances it and just enjoys it that little bit. It's like if I got the top of a mountain and I had, you know, a pint or something, it's really no different. Yeah, although if you got to the top of a mountain and drank three or four pints, it would be pretty tricky coming back down, I think. Yeah, but that's that's a good thing about weed, isn't it? I mean, it yeah. lasts like, what, 15 minutes or so? And um, then honestly, it wears off. And that's it. If you're climbing a mountain, right? you, know, you can hit your pipe, you can smoke your blunt at the start of the mountain, but fucking 10 minutes up that slope you won't be high no more <laughs> what about if you eat it though right then it lasts a good few hours you into that that's, that's uh no that's not something i've tried i've <gasps> i've, I've messed with edibles loosely but i don't really have the fucking time for that shit man like edibles <laughs> last six hours and come in waves that fucking attack you and confuse you it's like i got shit to do rob <laughs> 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 You never know in this game, like you never, particularly when I was, you know, gigging regularly, you just never know. It could be 3 p.m. on your day off and somebody might call you and say, hey, we've had a dropout. We need someone to come in. Now, if I've smoked a joint and it's three o'clock, I'll be fucking fine by eight. <laughs> but if I've had an edible, I cannot promise you I will be fine by eight. I have no idea. Right. And it just comes back and forth. And it's like, I don't mind an edible, but... Uh, I think it's a hell of a lot of weed you're using there. I yeah. think it's a very different high. I oh, just yeah. think it's that you've got to dedicate the time to. Uh, and when you're self-employed and you can always be on call, um, it's it's not something that I like to risk anyway. Mm. I think I'm just a bit strange because I can I can like have it and go on stage and stuff. It's, I don't know. It's a bit weird. Um, I, maybe to some I'll... degree I can as well, but I mean... That's the thing about edibles, like you just don't know, like you could be fine the first two waves and the third wave comes in and then you fucking cry and not stop <laughs> and then you leave and then the fourth wave kicks in and you're fine again. It's, it's really peculiar. Oil actually, I find is, I've had some THC oil and that shit is, one, it's so subtle. I mean, that shit is really almost like just a fucking enhancement thing, mm. like uh, almost like that limitless pill, it just makes me quick, it makes me sharp. Like a microdose uh, type smoke. thing. You know when you smoke a blunt sometimes and you... You just get all these beautiful ideas and you write it perfectly down and it's in no way you're stuttering and you just, your punchlines are straight there, etc., etc. I find like THC oil, it was like for me at the very least a six hour version of that. Everything was, everything, I, I, I the way I behaved was just better. Mm. How I operated was just better. Um, but you don't want to get in these habits. Today. Well, yeah, you <laughs> heard it here first, kids, do drugs. <laughs> I remember starting um, comedy, and uh, the reason I got 
uh, such a bad habit with smoking is because the adrenaline and the nerves of getting on stage get me and I used to have like three cigarettes before I go on stage. I remember when I was a kid and I smoked a little bit. I said, I'll never smoke more than one cigarette in a row. Like I don't think my throat, my lungs could handle it. Like mm. it would be too much pain. And when like I, I was waiting to go on stage, the adrenaline of that would hit me so bad, I'd have three in a row. And then because I couldn't smoke too close to stage or while I was on the stage, I start having like a pint and a half. Mm. And then the next thing I knew, I need a pint and a half to sort of just settle myself to go on stage. But it was mm. a very fine line because pint and a half or two pints. Oh God, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm there. I'm in the zone. I'm in the moment. The, the nerves are gone. I'm just there with the room dancing perfectly in sync. You know, two and a half to three. Oh shit. I start slurring my words. <laughs> Kid, don't know what I'm saying. Don't know what my next joke is. It's just such a fine line. So really, I yeah. mean, well, listen, there's a perspective comedian. We may have opened this with like drugs, but that is very much a hobby thing. If you want to do this, if you want to do this well, I mean, sobriety really is the best approach in my personal opinion. Or at least maybe not sobriety, but being able to do it sober most of the time. And that means you might be able to do it with a pint in your hand. You might be able to light a cigarette yeah. on stage like Dave Chappelle, but you want to approach this being able to do it in any state of mind. And that starts with being able to do it sober no matter what. I think so, like, yeah. Your rationality rides over your feelings. Yeah, I th- the the first the first gig I ever did, I was like, I was so tempted to have a drink or have a soak or something, and I was just like, just just don't, just see what it actually is like. Feel all of the things that in your natural panicked state you would feel in this environment, and uh, and I think it sets you up better. It gives you a, a more realistic idea of what it is, as opposed to like when I was. 18 or something and I was in a student uh production I'm I now this is a bit disgraceful so I very highly do not recommend this to anyone um I snorted a line of ketamine and then went on stage which at the time I thought was rock and roll um and maybe it was but um a terrible precedent to set I would say and that's (laughs) <laughs> that's why I no longer have a, uh, a septum. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three things on that. Um, number one, I mean, uh, yeah, a horse tranquilizer before a gig is not good. You've got to be to some degree active, energetic, focused in your brain. And something that tranquilizes a horse is probably not going to do that. <laughs> number two, look, to be fair, it is quite rock and roll. But if you don't mind me asking, how old are you, Rob? Uh, I am 35, I think, yeah. 35, I'm 28, and I think we're of a particular generation where we sort of believe in a false idea, this romanticism of rock and roll. I mm. think perhaps like me, you sort of grew up on these, these well, these rock stars, you know. Mm. You sort of heard the stories of the Americans, like Axl Rose. You, mm. you, you heard about the Gallagher brothers, Pete Doherty, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And particularly, I think I watched Al Murray and took it literally, and that probably <laughs> didn't right. And I kind of thought, you know, comedians should be living that DOS life where fucking, where we're jokers, bro. We've, mm. we've skipped capitalism. We've done the job where we're making money from pissing about. So we should be drinking and doing drugs before we go on stage and this, that, and the other. And we should be staying up till the dead of night drinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, I think two things that I've come to realize as I've got older is num- number one, yeah, we're of a particular generation who do that. I think the generation above us perhaps don't do that. Um, mm. just from the, and I think the younger generation are doing it less and less and, yeah. and, uh, they're expressing themselves less through the medium of external psychological substances. They're, they're expressing themselves through their social media through their, their uh, online subcultures and through, you know, YouTube and shit like that and on stage. And, and, and they're a lot better for it as performers. I really do think for me at the very least and for them watching, like, sobriety does really start to show in terms of skill and art. At the end of the day, it's still a job. It's still a craft. And we're not in the days anymore where, you know, somebody sees you, they scout you, they... They put you on and then you're a celebrity and you can just sort of get away with living that life. I think nowadays the competition is so fierce that if you do that, you get, if you are signed to a big agent or whatever, you get struck off pretty quickly. Uh, and some kid who's doing it properly will take your place. I mean, there are some who just override it and, and no matter how fucked they are, they can really do the business. You see Travis Scott and Post Malone in America and them motherfuckers are on psychedelics 24 seven. So all the power to them, all the credit to them. But I think. 
Uh, Macklemore has a song about getting addicted to drugs, um, uh, and he talks about moderation being the key and the fact that we're not all Snoop Dogg, and we can't all be Snoop Dogg, and I think that's that's very important. Uh, and the third thing I will say is yeah, just on that being a rock star, if you do it, your ketamine is a terrible drug, man. I've I seen know. some people really fall off the edge of the fucking oh, world. Oh, it's a disaster. Um, really fucked up their bladders and shit, if you're all listening. I want to tell you how to live your life, but you fucking do anything but ketamine. Do anything. <laughs> we could probably add a few other things to the list. Crocodile, I don't think, is to be advised. Uh, <laughs> just if you haven't heard of crocodile, Google it. It's spelled with a K. And look at those bones. Yeah, trigger warning. If you don't like seeing the inside of a Russian human being, <laughs> don't fucking look up crocodile. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's telling, isn't it, that you watch uh, or listen to some of the older acts. They're either all clean um, or uh, and sober, or they never perform with anything more than sort of like one drink, and it's always water on stage. You know what I mean? It's like even yeah. even Dylan Moran, who used to famously perform with you know wine and just chug it. He's he's finished all of that as well because it's just there's no longevity. Catches up. It catches up, yeah. particularly like, you know, if you're a rock star, if you're an indie band, you know, you have a certain shelf life. It's going to be 5, 10, 15 years, but like, you can't be fucking 45, 50, still changing the culture front and center for the fucking kids. Like, you might be playing at your, you can still be 45, you know, like, I went and seen Guns N' Roses and like, mm. Axl Rose's fucking God knows how old. I seen Nova <laughs> Revolver when I was 13. I fucking wonder how old Slash was then. Uh, but like, yeah, Velvet Revolver were different actually. They were pretty rock and roll. But Guns N' Roses, I mean, I fucking hell. I mean, yeah, shit, fucking. I did not want to hear all that Chinese democracy shit they played. No, uh, <laughs> disaster. Um, anyway, like, but you can play your core base fans, people who've heard you. But I think two things. Number one, um, you ain't gonna be front and center there. So like, you ain't gonna be changing the culture like that. So so like, you know, you get to a point where perhaps. You know, you can't be running around fucking doing ketamine when you got fucking kids and bills and mortgages and shit like that and you're only on tour for fucking a quarter of the year. But also, comedy and music are a very different beast. Uh, which to some degree, I'm not going to compare them to different art forms, but I think the live performance of music, once you've got it, that is a lot easier than the live performance of comedy. Once you know the track list and you've done it a thousand times or whatever, going up there on stage and playing it again, it's like for me playing the 30th day of my Edinburgh Fringe I did it once. The first Edinburgh Fringe I did, and that was an hour at the stand, I really fucking did that shit rock and roll. Mm. And I did the last day so fucked, I don't remember being on stage. I was hammered. <laughs> and I was younger then, but like I had just rehearsed it so many times. I knew it inside out that I could do it hammered. It was just in that part of my subconscious. It was like mm. when you're so pissed, you get home and you don't remember how you get home. Yeah. It was just there. I slurred my words a little bit, but I delivered it fine. But most of the time, that's not possible. In comedy, you got to be quick. You might have hecklers. Yeah. you got to respond to things. you got to be fluid like a fighter to some degree. And that doesn't really work well with alcohol and drugs. And Alcohol and drugs, you know, it's one of them like, the first spliff, the first pint, you really get that injection of, oh, God, I'm here, I'm operating on 125%, but by the seventh pint, you're like, oh, shit, I'm operating on 70. Now, when you're on the fucking 20th, 30th night of the 20th, 30th night of drinking, or whatever it is, then that, that catches up with you. You're operating on minus 30%. Yeah, it's just so, how the hell does Keith Richards do it? Because he's 159, and he's Apparently, he's still just cranking it out. I mean, I don't know his personal habits, but I don't think he's I ever... I think dis when you're that level of fame and riches, you can just fucking get like an IV injected into you or whatever. Yeah, do you think he's, get he's getting young men's blood <laughs> put pumped into his eyeballs on a regular basis? Yeah, exactly that, man. Like, when you're that level of fame and money, I mean, he's on a par with Donald Trump and fucking look at the treatment that guy got for fucking coronavirus. Oh God, yeah, ridiculous. But also, it's, it's genetic, you know, these things. Mm -hmm. um, I really, to some degree, think racist as this might be. I think there are genetic differences uh, in us. And I think, like, for example, white people and white European people are like, wow, well, I would argue that, uh, you know, it's, it's a fact, you know, it's a fact that Chinese people don't have the enzyme or yeah. that, that digests alcohol. And I think from that perspective, I think that maybe white Europeans who, particularly those in societies that perhaps have... And, you know, Darwinism has been challenged, you know, like, it doesn't take place over thousands of years. 
shit can like hybrids can genetic changes can fucking pop up overnight this has been uh proven through this finch this type of finch bird i can't remember but if you look up finch oh is this the the galapagos thing yes the galapagos exactly that each different island had its own different finch that was ever so slightly different but it was like perfectly tuned to its environment and then like they breeded with the next breed of finches and like they created this hybrid so when you're thinking of that perspective that means from there they worked out like humans could be the same and and actually you know if you look at like the history of like uh homo sapiens and homo denisova and neanderthals and all this kind of shit there Mm. may actually be biological differences either by ethnicity or race or something that goes back seventy thousand years and from this perspective i really think that like um you know for the past 300 400 years your ancestors were part of a society that drank beer every day for lunch and dinner because your rivers weren't clean enough. Mm. I think perhaps you're going to be able to handle your booze and wake up a bit more, um, a bit more uh, refreshed after a big night out than say I would, mm. because I come from a society which perhaps, while alcohol was prevalent for quite a long time, uh, going back to like, you know, the Mahabharat was written three, four thousand BC or something, and, and alcohol was is, is in those stories. Mm. Um, so my ancestors were drinking to some degree, but, but you know, I think my granddad probably didn't touch a drink. He smoked weed, and that's probably why I can smoke weed a lot better than your average European, <laughs> European, and I can wake up the next day and feel pretty refreshed. And if you take the tobacco out, I'm, I'm honestly no fucking different if I've smoked weed the night before. Mm. Uh, and I do think these things count, but when I drink, I, I'm perhaps not going to handle it the next night as well. Uh, I mean, the next morning, as well as perhaps a white European. It might not be white European. There might be something else there that gives these people who do handle their drink well a genetic... Maybe their fucking father was an alcoholic mm. uh, and they've managed to handle their booze as a result of it. Uh, I genuinely think from the way I've fucking food nurture, through how much I've hounded alcohol as a kid growing up in your castle <laughs> and as a club promoter, I think I basically drank so much in my younger years that where I am heading into my 30s, is actually where most people are heading in their 40s and 50s. And that's why I'm really like, oh, fuck, I need to cut this shit down. But I think my kids, fuck, they're going to have the ability to pound the booze, you've, man. You've put I think in if the this hybrid so exists and it can translate between one generation, fuck, my kids are going to be king of the alcoholics. Maybe that's, maybe, but they're not going to, they're going to be able to handle it. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to debilitate their life. Uh, yeah. And I know some people who are like, I know fucking doctors, man, who can fucking smash back eight pints wake up the next day and go play tennis they're, they're absolutely no way phased by it and it's something I've, I've always found pretty like amazing to watch yeah um, I've got friends who are doctors and they seem to go pretty hard as well there's something about that that culture that community that I mean maybe because it's they work so hard and such long hours yeah, incredibly hard incredibly long hours uh, maybe there's an emotional aspect as well um mm. You know, my, my mate's father was a doctor as well, so maybe the, the genetic superiority I've been talking about is passed on in that regard. Mm. But um, yeah, like it's 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 a brutal job, man. Like people say, you know, your job is hard. Like fucking, what happens if I struggle at work, man? That's a bad day at work for me. Twenty minutes of awkwardness, and then I forget about it, and the audience forget I ever exists. What's a bad <laughs> work for them, man? Fucking three people die. Fucking forty people come in and with coronavirus. They don't know what the fucking disease is. They don't know how to fucking handle it. And 40 people die on the ward. Like, yeah. that's going to make me want to drink up. Yeah, you can see why people become GPs. They're like, oh, sod this. I'm just going to sit in a chair and Google people's problems instead. Yeah, dealing with fucking, you know, annoying, perhaps people who are hypochondriacs or whatever isn't as bad as that crazy life at A&E. Definitely not. But um, speak- A&E to some degree. Sorry? Not too dissimilar to stand up. Yeah. Uh, in that regard, it's not too dissimilar to UFC. Obviously, they're very, very different jobs. But just in terms of the adrenaline buzz that hits you when you're in there and how quick you have to make your decisions, that, you know, you got to make quarter-second decisions. It's, it's live or die by your next joke. Uh, somebody will live or die by the decision you make. Um, it's live or die by the next punch. I, I think they're all very similar in that in that regard. Uh, bomb disposal is a similar job. Hmm. I've got a funny story about that if you want it. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a comedian uh, I, I knew... Um, and it did comedy for a hobby, um, which I've always found peculiar because for me, it's just a very nerve wracking experience. After I come off stage, most of the time I remember why I'm doing it and I remember why I'm there and why I really enjoyed it, etc., etc. 
But um, beforehand, I'm just like, why? Why am I here? Why am I putting myself through this? What the fuck am I doing to myself? What the fuck am I doing to my body? And I asked this comedian why I did it as a hobby. And he said, oh, before I came back to England, I was a bomb disposal expert in Afghanistan. Christ. And since I've come back, it was like a bit of a jarhead moment. Stand-up comedy was the closest thing I could find to replicating the adrenaline surge of disposing of that bombs. And hilarious. straight away I knew what he meant. <laughs> straight away I was like, fucking hell yeah, I understand. But at the same time I was like, oh no. Oh no, 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 no. That's not healthy. That's yeah. not healthy. What the fuck am I putting my body and my mind through every night? That's like... I'm putting myself through the equivalent of like going to war every night. That's not fucking good for you. And getting a Fitbit uh, has really compounded that theory, man. Fucking, you know, you're on stage, your heart will go up to 110. And then for like five hours after, and this is where the fucking insomnia comes yeah. from, it's still at like 90. That shit is not healthy. Yeah, well, it's, it, I mean, thinking about it, just like we were talking about evolutionary, it's like, what would be the natural equivalent of being on stage to a large crowd and just chatting shit, trying to make everyone laugh? That doesn't really exist. I mean, we've had, I guess, you know, storytellers around a campfire that would be sort of like the closest thing or, or like a, a court jester. I don't know, but probably they, probably their adrenaline was even higher than a stand up. Sorry, what was the last thing you said? I missed that, sorry. Uh, probably a court jester's adrenaline was even higher than a stand-up because, it, you know, it, in terms of dying, it wasn't a metaphorical death that they were staring down the barrel of. Oh, oh yeah, if you were the Lenny Bruce of court jesters, man, you ain't getting arrested, you're getting your fucking tongue chopped <laughs> off, no matter how justifiable your joke was about the king. Um, but court <laughs> jesters as well could become really powerful people if they they, they they did the right things and said all the right things and, and really wowed the king the way he wanted. Uh, but yeah, I suppose they are the closest things we have. But, 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 but it's, it's... Yeah, it's, it's complex, I think. Back then, perhaps, particularly, you know, the guy around the fucking campfire was probably motivated by more honest intentions. Yeah. Probably less of a narcissism. Yeah. It's probably just like, we've had a very long, hard day. We had to leave disabled Janet by the tree because we couldn't <laughs> carry her anymore. She's going to fucking rot or get eaten by wolves. Um, fucking, we got attacked by the Neanderthals. They carried off fucking Jimmy's wife. Oh, God, that's terrible. Uh, fucking, they stabbed two of us. The fucking saber-toothed tiger ate fucking Tony's child. Um, and there was probably just this need to say, like, this isn't it, guys. There's something to be had in life. There's something to be enjoyed. You know, a dingo ate my baby came from a dingo eating someone's fucking baby. <laughs> um, I think around the campfire, you know, that was probably less narcissist, uh, more just a deep-rooted empathy and going, fuck, man, my people need something. My yeah. people need something or they're Absolutely. not going to get up tomorrow. I love the way your prehistoric humans are all called Janet, Jimmy, and Tony. <laughs> These are the prehistoric names. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's great. I'm already creating scenarios in my head for these prehistoric tracks. Can't fucking then, you know, think back seven years and be like, well, he would have been called Cthulhu. Fucking Cthulhu's a sea, sea, a sea monster. Like, I don't fucking know what prehistoric tribes would have gone by. We're, we're going for Tony, Janet, and Jimmy. That's what we're sticking with. <laughs> uh, oh, but I think maybe even then there would have been that little bit of adrenaline. I don't know, maybe fucking, uh, fucking. Connor, or whatever the fucking comedian's name is, <laughs> Connor would have been there and he would have been like, I cracked this joke about fucking Jimmy's fucking child being eaten by a leopard. Neither. The whole crew are going to laugh and it's going to give us some sort of potential verve and some sort of inspiration yeah. that this is all worth it. Or they're going to fucking kill That's, me for me. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about Jimmy's baby being fucking eaten by a leopard. Right. Or even worse, perhaps, um, exiled. I read this thing once that, um, you know how people often say, like, the, the cliche thing is that the number one fear of, pub, uh, of uh, fear is public speaking. Um, and the number one, two, the number two fear is death. So people are literally more afraid of speaking in public. And there was this theory uh, that I, I have no idea if it's true, but it seemed interesting that that's because the only reason you'd ever need to address a large group is when they've got their pitchforks pointed at you and you're begging for your life, trying to make your case. 
Two things. Uh, I think that is partially how I became a comedian. Um, brown man escaping racism. Newcastle brown male. Yep. But the chavs who would have beat me up for being brown changed their mind when they found out I was funny. So yeah. it became a very quick defense mechanism. Yeah, it's and number two, that's actually that's fucking strange, man. You really hit a lot of notes and stuff uh, within the first early moments of this uh, interview that I'm that I'm really interested in. That that campfire shit and that sapien shit, I fucking love. Mm. Uh, and ironically, that was the opening joke of my last Edinburgh show. All my heroes are dead, in jail, or touched up my nan. I said, no, it's a cliche. Well, I didn't say it was a cliche because I think to non-comics, uh, it, it, when you spell it out like that, it's a surprise. The number two fear people have is death. Number one fear people have is, is public speaking. Mm. Um, I, I reckon this is because in that limbic part of our brain, that bit that's existed for 70,000 years, that bit that operates on impulse and feeling and instinct, not that bit that is capable of doing what we're doing now, rational conversation and breaking things down and working costs out and such, that limbic part, that, that instinctual part, what it fears more than anything is group rejection. Mm. Because inside, if you open yourself up to your tribe and you get rejected, that is literally the end of the world for 70,000 years until to some degree did we develop some notion of a society and even exile people can form their own little societies. Um, mm. And I think that is why not only are people afraid of doing stand-up comedy, but it's also why people are so offended by stand-up comedy, mm. more than movies, more than anything else. Because when you see your story, your humanity, when you've opened yourself up at your weakest uh, your deepest, you've just shown your humanity and your weaknesses and your flaws mm. and you see that being laughed at that just ticks that limbic part of your brain I, mm. I told the joke a bit more succinctly I'll be honest, in the show <laughs> it was a year ago now <laughs> and it very quickly got the punchline but this is a podcast so you know I see it less as telling jokes and more about explaining the theory behind them <laughs> and like, when that bit responds that you get offended and before you know it your limbic part stood up and go hey I'm fucking offended or you heckle a comedian or whatever yeah. um, but that's why I was so scared to do comedy, that's why I was so scared to be offended by comedy. So, you know, taking that in mind, when we, the comedian, take this risk every night, you, the audience, need to buck your fucking ideas up, you little pussies. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, speaking of, uh, of, of comedy um, and, uh, and of fighting, actually, because I saw one of your posts, which just, this made me laugh so hard, Roll, was you did the retrain for skills thing. And uh, what, what, do you want to tell people what, what what choices they said you should consider? Yeah, they said I should be a professional sportsman or a boxer. That is what they told me to do. Or an actor, which is pretty much the same as what I was fucking doing anyway. Uh, really piss poor. I don't know how the fuck I'm going to do either of those three things, particularly because there's a more famous Rahul Kohli, who is an actor anyway, who's just been in that new Netflix show, The Haunting of... Billy Manor or whatever the fuck oh, it's called. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, 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 a boxer, like, I have tiny hands, bro. <laughs> tiny, tiny hands. Um, and I don't really... Like, if I knew how to throw a punch, I wouldn't have learned how to tell a joke. That, that wouldn't yeah, be a yeah, given. Yeah. I would have just been tough and wouldn't have needed to use humor as a defense mechanism. I would have just been able to hand myself from day. Uh, a professional sports like, what the fuck what? like how, I mean, what am I going to do go in the Premier League yeah like, exactly you know, comedy's not viable but fucking NUFC striker is what <laughs> the fuck are you thinking I don't understand how the algorithm is so poorly tuned it's like the whole drive here has been like people in the arts need to retrain right and then it's like well then why is actor one of the possible outcomes of this quiz like it yeah, should why wouldn't Sorry, so, it, it, should, it should be, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're following what they're saying on the government stuff, it should be just no matter what answer you put, it just says tech. Cause that seems to be all they want people to do. But also, like, I get it. I really do get it. Tech is the, the new frontier of the, the, the third or second industrial revolution or whatever the fuck they call it. Um, Cyber security is something that they have highlighted that is greatly... Uh, 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 missing um but like why the fuck would you want artists doing your cyber security the last <laughs> thing you want is me it's the last fucking defense mechanism for bank accounts against criminal fucking cyber hackers who've been doing it all their lives like tech requires quite an understanding of maths <laughs> quite an attention to details 
or we're sky was man to some degree do you know what i mean and even if we're not we deal with feelings and soul and spirituality they are not really transferable in that regard like you really want a fucking ballerina trying to hack isis's fucking twitter (laughs) account it doesn't sound like in any way a sensible fucking policy for me Oh, but maybe, <laughs> but maybe it's maybe it's exactly what we need because maybe the uh, the hackers out there are all thinking you know along one line, whereas like a ballerina is going to come up in there and just completely change the game, approach hacking in a totally new way. Um, maybe not though. What, I think the Russians are going to be there. Like, how the fuck was I going to know her password was Swan Lake? I've never seen Swan Lake, man. <laughs> Uh, but but um but going back to comedy how how has it how's it been performing uh you but you're based in newcastle are you or, or are you i was based in london in the middle of the pandemic but after three months of paying 400 pounds for a coffin sized room couldn't really it was an illegal sublet i could leave at any time i suppose um i kind of felt a bit guilty on my flatmates because hey i felt guilty on everyone you know there's a lockdown um my parents were like at, seemingly quite high risk so i didn't want to get them to come pick me up from the other side of the fucking country that was mm. also illegal the fucking hell maybe i'd gone sooner if i'd known what dominic cummings had done exactly. but there was all this going on um on top of that uh, i thought my flatmates would struggle to fill the room i try to work things out i try to get them to ask the landlord to see if we could get like a rent reduction maybe mm. i could stay from that regard but it just wasn't feasible. It became too much after three months of paying, you know, 1,200 collectively and getting nowhere coming in and my savings being burnt mm. on that. Yeah. It was time to come home, man, and just, uh, I'm living with my parents now, not paying any rent, uh, which is very, very lucky and I'm very privileged mm. to do so. A lot, a lot of people cannot really, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues cannot do that. A lot of my colleagues are parents themselves. And they have kids, uh, they need to support themselves and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but I've been able to do that. I mean, I don't think anyone uh, can blame you. I've, I've got tons of friends who've left London in this pandemic. It's just, yeah. it's, it's a ridiculous situation. And if, you know, the whole point of London is there's loads of shit going on. Well, if nothing's going on, then what am I here for? Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not going to pay, for, it's location, location, but why am I paying £400 and not be able to work there? Do you know what I mean? The whole yeah. point was that I can network with people, do gigs in London, and perhaps get spotted by big producers, whatever. But that went down the drain, obviously, so I moved back to Newcastle. Um, been getting a few Northeast gigs, uh, but all the fees are reduced and such, so, you know, I'm not taking in much a month. I mean, hang on, I'll tell you if you want, if you'd like, if it would uh, be suitable for the podcast um how many gigs i've done this month and how much i've made if you want i mean yeah sure why not the so, 2nd of october i had a birthday party in gloucester that was cancelled but they never told me but i'll get the 10 percent deposit for that 40 quid after pretty much just zoning in on the marketplace that organized it and telling them that they them taking the 40 pound deposit was pretty fucking just yeah. disgusting really in times like this uh, yeah <laughs> um, absolutely i had a sort of zoom podcast on the fourth that was unpaid um 10 minute gig for xs malagi that was a small fee 50 pounds uh I recorded film took some headshots because all my headshots are amazingly old on wednesday with my cousin the 7th of october 8th of october i did a gig that was meant to be 100 pound in manchester but because of lack of numbers it went down to 52 pounds but that is uh, the nature of it. I re-signed with my agent this month, uh, and he got me a £200 middle in Blackpool, nice. which was much needed. And then on the Tuesday, I did a gig for Robin Perkins. I think we'll command a small fee. Uh, it's a Zoom gig again. Wednesday, I did board game Smackdown, 14th of October. Small fee. The last time I did that, I got £4. Um, recorded a podcast. Yesterday more? No, I was, oh no, that never happened. I never recorded that podcast. Um, <laughs> um, I was meant to have a gig on Sunday the 18th, but that was rescheduled. That was £100, it was rescheduled. I meant to do a gig on Monday, I was probably going to pay a 10 hour Zoom gig, but that's been rescheduled. Um, then today we're doing yours, that's unpaid. Then tomorrow <laughs> I've got a meeting that's unpaid, but who knows, might need to big things. And then this weekend I'm doing the stand for £75, Friday, Saturday. Um, and then I, that's it, really. You know, so yeah. that's 350. 
450 pounds, man. That's, well, there we uh, go. See, if you'd stayed in London, you'd still have 50 quid in your pocket, burning uh, a hole, huh? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's mental, um, there, isn't it? And that means I can spend on all the equipment and tech you need to make it in YouTube because you've got to capture them that three second framework. It's a very shallow thing. I'm going to get some purple contact lenses because uh, you know the kids are all out here in their Snapchat filters. They don't give a fuck about what's real. They just, you know, they're very shallow in that regard. The algorithms do that to us. They apply more to our limbic part of our brain yeah. than our rational part of our brain because they know that's the one that gets us to act. So the 4K cameras and shit like that, they make all the difference. They really, really do. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen that um, that social dilemma uh, documentary? Goes into. I've not, this. but my show last year on my heroes of dead in jail, touch every nine, was a sort of very similar, very similar themes. I've heard, mm. um, and it zones in on you know, essentially. It's really horrible. I think what's happened. Um, you know, you had the tabloids of the eighties and nineties, and social media has essentially turned us into the tabloids. Mm. Whether it be you know somebody at work's been fucking exposed or something, or where we're all fucking excited to gossip about them, or, or watch two people we know and, and fight with each other, we get the popcorn out, um, and we're just all sort of stuck in our own. Ironically enough, this mechanism that has produced individual voices has got rid of any sense of individuality. Mm. We're all either fucking Nazis or, or snowflake fucking anti or Antifa now, who are simultaneously snowflakes and violent at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, and I just think we're so. It's, I think it's the nature of when your newspaper has no literal end in sight. Yeah. You have to break things down actually into very binary categories, mm. which actually. For all the people who want to, uh, you know, think that things are getting more non-binary and they think they're applying to their subcultures, they actually don't realize that what's doing to everybody else is breaking us down into two very, very small and simple groups. And I think it's going to really have some, you know, it's a shame. I'm, I, and I'm, perhaps I'm criminal because I, instead of perhaps just getting a job helping homeless people or something, I'm narcissistically decided to go, no, I spent eight years building my live scene, which perhaps has some more, I wouldn't say altruism, but a bit more kindness to it than trying to manipulate people's brains. So perhaps I'm just more openly aware of it on social media because you're looking at the marketing and the optimization mm. from this perspective. But, um, you know, I'm, I've, I've decided to do that. But, but, but I think, like, I think social media has been terrible for society, man. I think yeah. I really can't see how the American election won't end in violence to some degree. No, same, same. And there's there's no sort of there's no fix in sight. Do you know what I mean? It's it's sort of the nature no. of the beast is like you you kind of can't. So like you know they can ban a QAnon group or something or or flag a tweet as as something. But but the way culture's got at this point, if something's flagged, then a certain group of people will be like, oh, it's just censorship as opposed yeah, to maybe the content. Censorship was. and everyone's crying censorship and fake news. This is why I was arguing uh, in an article I read the other day, The Death of Democracy, Why Comedy and Journalism Need Less Free Speech. Because I don't actually think the problem is that free speech is being censored. I don't think it's like, as Huck, uh, sorry, I do think it is like Huxley said. I don't think it's like Orwell said. I don't think it's the government watching us. I think to some degree it is now. Hmm. You know, you've got these companies like Palantir, and you've got these governments like, uh, like, like, like Boris who's using data, to manipulate us. But I think while that is still a problem, the main problem is we're all distracted by each other. It's yeah. too much free speech. Like, what happens when you have absolute fundamental freedom of speech, which we currently are as close as we ever have been as a society to, is everyone talks at the same time. Mm. And we've done it a couple of times in this podcast. Me and you've talked at the same time, and what that means is no one listens. <laughs> and we've been polite enough in regards to this podcast and perhaps a shared understanding. Oh, sorry, 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 I'll stop there. What were you saying? And perhaps we get on in a certain degree or we understand the mechanism of the podcast that we will stop and listen to one another. But that's just not happening on social media. And social media does these terrible things. Like, it tricks you into thinking what you're saying is more important than what everybody else is saying. And I think listening is, is such an important part of humanity. And mm. more importantly, it tricks you into thinking that being wrong is the end of your life and this shameful, terrible experience mm. that you'll be ripped for by everybody else that you should be ashamed of. Whereas actually being wrong is such a normal human part of growth in life you should be wrong quite a few times in your life if you're mm -hmm. not wrong in your life fucking hell like you you go through your life being right all the time you're going to be a very arrogant piece of shit by the end of it you're probably going to end up similar to donald trump yes i would imagine so 
Um, the president of the United States, you mean? No. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, history will judge him, yeah. not the papers. So he may be president of the United States, but when he goes down as America's communist, when he goes down as the man that broke one of the greatest experiments in free thought yeah. that's ever existed, one of the greatest empires that has ever existed, whether you like empires or not, History's not going to look on him fondly in that regard. I, I can't imagine that it will, but maybe at this, maybe at that point, history will also have bifurcated, and people will be just believing their own version of history on alternative Wikipedia in some hellscape of the future that could just be two weeks away. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps so. But I, I also would say, you know, history never goes away. You know, the sea people destroyed the Hittite. The Mesopotamian and the Mycenaean Empire. But we still know that story. We don't know exactly who the sea people are, but we some, to some degree know who these people are. Uh, and perhaps, you know, in a thousand years, they'll look at it and say, okay, so the second dark age of 2020 that lasted for three centuries, you know, that was caused by a blonde narcissist. We still haven't zoned in on whether it was Donald Trump or Katie Price. <laughs> One of these bastards. One of these bastards. They broke everything. I actually think if there is some sort of degree of history, still, I think Mark Zuckerberg will take the lion's share of the blame, uh, uh, yeah. in my personal opinion. Yeah, that's, that's very yeah, likely. Yeah, some degree as well. Yeah, Bezos as well. He's just an endless hoover for the world's wealth. I just don't understand why you would... I can't understand that mindset. I can't understand why you would... That's what your end goal would be. I don't know. Maybe I've, I've, maybe he grew up broke as fuck. I mean, I've always grown up with money and you have to take that into account. Anyone who says, our money doesn't buy your happiness has never been fucking broke. Mm -hmm. uh, because it fucking does. If you're broken, you can't feed your kids. And then all of a sudden you come into money and there's food on your fucking kid's table. That will bring a fucking smile to your face. Yeah. Um, definitely. and I just think it's a very rich thing that people say. I mean, yes, it's not the end goal and you will find other things that will make you miserable. Uh, once you've got money and once you've secured money regularly. But believe you me, once you run out of money quick, as everybody, a lot of people noticed at the start of this lockdown and at the start of this pandemic, and are starting to realise now, being broke can fucking depress you. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think it's a fucking rich kid's mantra from people who've never, ever had to worry about that potential pressing. Um, but, but, but again, so as I say, I, I, I'll be honest, I am a rich kid um, and I've... I've, I've and from a result, I've never perhaps been able to look at the world for Jeff Bezos' view, but I, I don't know. My, my initial instinct is that if you've managed to set up a huge tech company like that, you're probably at the very best middle class, up a middle class growing up. But I just don't understand how, like, I love Bill Gates. I fucking hate all this QAnon shit and this, ah, you got to fucking try this with a vaccine. And so I think he's a wonderful human being. I think he's somebody who's, him and Melinda have committed phenomenally to, um, solving the world's problems um they've helped near enough eradicate polio and they were so mm. close and unfortunately coronavirus has sort of distracted now uh, as well as that um you know distrust in pakistan afghanistan through yeah. that guy who was doing vaccines and was actually working for the americans and um you know directed them to bin laden as a result you know a lot of people distrust vaccines there um but 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 but, but they were so close to eradicating polio before coronavirus brought it back in both Afghanistan and Pakistan and um, they have done but they have eradicated so many countries and that's a beautiful thing we should be very fucking thankful they've done so much for humankind they are so committed to helping the human species and yet they get all this criticism for being fucking pedo yeah. vaccine trackers or whatever and you just think like you're sharing like you're sharing these on the billionaires who are fucking taking from us are Zuckerberg and Bezos and yeah. these, their websites where you're picking up this information, and I do wonder if the, 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 mm. the, these websites spread that information almost deliberately to try and distract from the billionaires who are just taking and taking and giving nothing back. And Bill Gates is one of the only people I've heard who's talked about technological corporate responsibility. Like, these people are the new kings, these people are the new nobles, and if they want to rule the world and hoover up all our money, then fine. But there has to be some balance. They have to pay their taxes or they have to give back to what they're taking from, which I really don't think Facebook and Amazon are currently doing, and I just don't understand how you get to that wealth. And Jeff Bezos has given fucking absolutely nothing, very little comparatively back yeah. to any charities or any sort of constructive things that might help society. And I just don't understand how you can just 
that's all you want to do in life, business, business, business. The customer mm. is always right. You just want to build this phenomenal tech model. And it is a phenomenal tech model. Yeah. What it's done is amazing. I'll be honest, I'm a hypocrite because I'm a member of Amazon and post Facebook. But nonetheless, like, I just can't understand how that's your end goal. And when you talk, can't, like, look at the world around you, go, oh, fuck, I need to do a little bit more. Otherwise, like, all this money I've accrued for my kids, fuck, it's going to be useless. They're going to be kings and queens of the ashes. Well, exactly. I mean, like, like what you said earlier, it's really interesting. It's like yeah, money doesn't buy you happiness. Maybe the way I think about it more is like the lack of money definitely brings you unhappiness. But um, at a certain point, above a certain level, when you've got your needs covered, you're able to have a few luxuries here and there. Ha- definitely f- your fifth yacht doesn't buy you happiness. Do you know what I mean? Your your extra your fiftieth billion. That's not that's not going to tick you over again higher on some some weird happiness scale that you can you can't even quantify anyway. In, as much as obviously some people have tried. Yeah, mm. really interesting. Yeah, Bill Gates is. One of those man. Like in life, we develop our habits, and we uh, end up getting to a certain age where we have a modus operandi, and we realise what works for us and what doesn't work for us. You know, what worked for me was being a funny, charming guy that got me out of bad situations. Uh, it got me girls. It got me um, attention at parties. It got me all the human things I wanted. And, you know, for certain people, maybe just buying fucking luxury items was what got them girls, what got people talking mm-hmm. and then what made them feel heard, what made them feel important. And I think that's all we're really looking for is human beings, some sense of purpose, identity and belonging. And, it, yeah. you know, once you get in that modus operandi, it's, it's hard to see the... Um, the 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 wood from the trees in that regard it's hard to actually say oh this isn't actually bringing me that much happiness actually some of this happiness and some of these people are fake um and you see it sometimes a lot of businesses you're seeing it with the barclays brothers right now oh shit sorry um the barclays brothers their success was based on the fact that there were two brothers that operated and they fought for each other they didn't fight for nails but they met kids and then their kids started to fight against each other and it's just perhaps maybe they got to a point where they're so used to closing deals and, and, and getting the best deal for themselves and leaving the other party fucked or, or fucked over mm. because that's a better deal for them that they eventually reached a point where they couldn't see the wood from the trees. They started fucking over each other. They started fucking over the people they love. And if there's not something, you see it in gangster TV series, you know, mm. there has to be some limit to your morals. There has to be some line. If, if you start to fucking turn on the gang, everything falls in on itself. And I think that's what we're seeing now as a society. If you apply that wider society, like certain people have decided that they just want to take, take, take it and make as much money as possible and, and build their tech. And they think they're advancing society, but all they're really doing is making things easier for middle class consumers. But there's only so much you can push what is now a very large portion of working class people. And there is only so high you can build your fences. There is only... Mm-hmm so many islands you can stay on before they build boats and fucking come for everything you've got. Like, I'm sorry, this isn't alarmist and this isn't Mm -mm. ludicrous. Like, this is exactly how the French Revolution happened. This is exactly how the Bolshevik Revolution happened. If you marginalize people and they're starving and they're not eating and their kids aren't eating, well, that desperation turns to violence. This has just Mm. been a time-old story throughout the history of humankind. And I really think these tech guys and these billionaires need to do some fucking more. Otherwise, like, look, their kids still study at our institutions. They still come to the mainland. Yeah. If you're living in an island or, or you're living in some sort of uh, gated society, like, they still come to the mainland. They still study at our societies that are in our city centers. They still, uh, they, your staff still use our public transport and our roads. And I nearly got stabbed by a mentally ill guy in London. It could happen to one of them. And, uh, and this is building and building and building and building. And if they don't do something soon, if they don't step in and try and in in if they don't try and just fucking do something in terms of actual proper governance and start thinking for their peoples, we're gonna fall off. And I actually think you're starting to see it. I think what you're gonna see is Europe and Canada really stake their claim to the kings of Western civilization over the next hundred years. And two people or two empires that have always operated more so with the intention of keeping their billionaire class happy than they have of looking out for their people that have always operated with corruption more than actual fair capitalism, like America and Britain, you're going to see us fall off the wagon. You're going to see us really struggle. You're going to see us seize instances of civil disobedience, riots, war, and you're going to see our societies fall off a cliff edge to some degree. Holy fuck. (laughs) 
feeling feeling it might not be as violent as that but i think in terms of our power it's yeah. definitely waning We're seeing that already we are seeing that already yeah and the longer this this ridiculous situation that we're all living through now goes on surely the more exacerbated all that's going to get yeah and i just really hope it doesn't get to the point where you know me and my neighbour, who I dislike, uh, have to build a gate on our fucking cul-de-sac and get some fucking rifles. But uh, yeah, it's so, so weird, man. Last year, I read a book called The Death of Grass. It was about a Chinese virus that caused a famine that led to mass violence. And uh, a brother that had to relocate from London back up north to protect himself. And uh, yeah, yeah, man, you ever just get the feeling fucking art imitates reality? <laughs> You ever just get the feeling that like the universe is your conception and fucking you know got that bit Walt powers? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Game of Thrones is immensely similar to what is happening right now. Fucking blonde narcissistic tyrant destroying Western civilization. <laughs> um, if only he was as Marginalized all their life, trying to regain some sort of 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 uh, status or regain what they feel is their rights but but in actual essence not realizing that the way that they're doing it and the violence with which they're doing it is is in fact causing a fracture in society that may be beyond repair it's it's yeah, George R. R. Martin's a fucking genius man but like uh, I just keep thinking art has imitated reality uh, uh, with a lot of the TV shows I watch but I suppose that's that's the nature of humanity you, you reflect on what you see in, in history mm. repeat itself over and over yeah, it does, it does. Is there any way to, to break this cycle, do you think? Oh, man, I'm kind of listening to these Andrew Yang podcasts like, fuck, we missed the chance. He was the guy. He, he was, was really the guy. He yeah. really fucking... And I was a Bernie guy till two days ago, till I actually listened to the Andrew Yang podcast. I really liked his universal basic income. He was maybe my third, but I had uh, listened to more Elizabeth Warren and listened to more Bernie Sanders and just not really looked at this outside candidate the way I should have but wow that guy was because I think those two are perhaps stuck in perhaps old leftist paradigms which perhaps if you try and implement like Jeremy Corbyn would face enormous backlash and would really sort of perhaps struggle in America but I think Andrew Yang was coming from a whole different perspective he's coming from the perspective of an entrepreneur and he was good look guys as a government as a society we spend more on punishing opiate addicts and locking them up then we would do decriminalizing and trying to help these people. That would actually be better for our society, better for us all at large. It would be fucking cheaper for us. This is an entrepreneur going, look, tech companies, you, you, you're not bad people. You're doing your job. You're building things um, to make. But look, this is the press that we're at. And he said one thing that almost just fucking moved me as somebody who's had a niece recently, like he just said. And I saw all this kind of automation thing, and I saw the way the media misrepresented the story and said it was racism when actually it was a jobs issue. And I looked at my daughter and I saw how society was going to go and I didn't want this society for her. I couldn't bear the thought of her growing up in this, in this, in this, in this, in this sort of violent civil unrest society. Mm. And I just think he really knew the score and I just think it's going to take somebody, somebody with that understanding of tech companies and with that understanding of economics and with that understanding of modern economics and entrepreneurship to just go to Jeff Bezos and just go to Facebook. Look! Being worth two trillion ain't shit if you gotta fucking build a castle in Barbados. Society is on a knife edge. Don't you fucking see that? Can you fucking see that? You've, <coughs> you've caused this, Mark. You've caused this, Jeff. I don't care. Keep most of your money. But like, two trillion. Just give us like, fucking, set, I can't do the maths. Like, that's why I'm perhaps not the best. But like, 75 billion or whatever, a small amount of that. To just fucking improve the roads and mm. build some homeless shelters and build some fucking clinics for opiate addicts mm. and fucking like, look, it's your interest as well. I mean, I fucking set up, a, I was joking about setting up a political party, but I, I wrote a manifesto that was all based on some yang yang principles. Uh, uh, and the first, the, the essence of it is that in my heart, I believe altruism is greed. You know, there's that cliche that what is what what's the most what's the worst punishment for a, somebody in prison self isolation yeah you're yeah, in a yeah. building full of rapists and murderers and yet being isolated being on your own is the worst thing they can do to you i think it's a joe rogan joke hmm. 
But it is so true. Humans are not built for isolation. We're not built for exile. It comes back to what we're saying about people, why people are scared and offended of stand-up comedy. We're built to connect. Mm. That's consciousness in our heart of hearts. I truly believe that. And if that makes me a fruitcake, whatever. But we are built to connect. Even if you're racist, whatever, you still love your nan, you still love your fellow white man. And you still go out and you see art and you, you engage with people and you, you love the excitement of being in a bar and meeting someone and, and knowing that, that meeting that new person, the potential is endless. And that can very quickly change as it has done through the history of mankind to meeting someone and that potential isn't you're going to connect. That potential is they're going to fucking stab you with a fucking stick and take all the food you forage and all your fucking berries and take your woman and shit like that. And we've built this society now since the 80s, which is instead of catering for, at least in the West, in England and in, in the UK and in America, that hasn't catered for human beings. And it's not catered in the idea of building a nation. It is catered in the idea that, well, capitalism is better than feudalism. Mm. Let's just pay attention to the numbers. The more economic growth we're having, the better things are doing. And they've used that to, 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 to baffle and bamboozle the working and even the middle classes now. Mm. And it's stupid because the upper class rely on, a, rely on a burgeoning middle class to buy their fucking goods. And if that burgeoning middle class don't exist, that burgeoning middle class and that working class become an underclass that become resentful and angry. It's just basic economics. It's just basic history. And we've just had this thing that is catered towards billionaires and banks and the people who have capital. And what's happened is, is we created this society where those who have capitalism, can, uh, those who have capital, can use their capital to expand their capital exponentially. And those who do not just fucking spend £400 a month in rent and all this other shit just desperately trying to survive, but... That desperation is, but I really worry, man. I don't know if I am being alone, but that desperation is catching up with us. And if we don't address it, as I say, these people are going to be nothing but the billionaires of the ashes. They're going to be billionaires of a worthless currency. Yeah, yeah. And the more that, that wealth disparity grows, the, the, the more excessive it's going to be. It's, it all just accumulates in an ever smaller percentage up the top and the rest of us are just sort of left behind. And I think this um, this pandemic has, has worsened that, not only financially, but also socially. You know, um, just as, as a group, we're starting to forget what it means to congregate, what it means to rub shoulders with strangers, even what it means at this point to see people's facial expression. I mean, I was in the, 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 the shop the other day and, um, you know, there was a baby there and he was kind of like, looking at me trying to you know make a connection like they do they're curious they're learning about the world and I was like smiling at him and making faces but I was wearing a mask so how much of that information is being lost at a, at a crucial point in this young individual's development and the longer that continues how how much of that will be lost forever how much of that is rescuable at a later point I don't know. It feels fucking terrifying, and like we're we're right in the abyss here, Raul. We're right right deep in the abyss here, mate. That is terrifying, and that's something I've not previously considered. That impact on babies and masks and facial expressions, and I think you're very right to bring it up. Uh, just going back, and I, I would apply that still to Facebook. I think that's the big problem: is <coughs> if your nan, <coughs> oh sorry, yeah, right. that's um, I'm hoping, I'm fucking hoping. <laughs> my lungs being clean of smoke for about two, three weeks and now coughing up all the toxins as opposed to any, any, any virus. But nonetheless, uh, but I think that's something that we really applied to Facebook. It's like if your nan says something racist, it's not that you go, oh, well, she was brought up in a different time. You go, that's my fucking nan, man. Mm. That is somebody who loves me unconditionally. Mm. Like my nan, for example, is very racist towards Pakistanis and Muslims. Naturally, she grew up in partition. Her great grandfather was shot. I mean, her dad, sorry, my great grandfather mm. was shot by Pakistanis. They never found his body. To this day, oh, her, 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 her brother uh, and her sister, when they were to the dying day uh, of her sister, her sister would say, let's go look for dad. He's still out there. He's still out there. Wow. Naturally, you know, the shit they saw and you speak to Pakistani kids and it's interesting because a lot of Indian and Pakistani kids, 
we don't feel the same. We banded together to fight white racist kids. Right. So we, we really get on. Uh, same with the Bangladeshis. And it's really nuts to think that our parents and grandparents will hate each other because of these deep rooted feelings to do with well, very understandable deep rooted feelings yeah. to do with, um, to do with, to do with, uh, 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 uh war, uh, and, uh, just horrible instances of torture and oppression. But, but nonetheless, like my nan is unconditional. She doesn't speak. English. I don't speak Hindi, and yet my nan loves me unconditionally. She's always cooking food for me. She's always looking out for me, and I think that's truly beautiful. I think that, yeah. if anything, that connection that my grandma has to me in that regard is the essence of what we should be aiming for as human beings. Essentially, we need to somehow, over time, apply what my grandma has for me. We need to apply that to a community, to a society. We should all be feeling that for our neighbours. And that may seem wishy-washy, that may seem far-fetched, but I think we've got so far already. The fact that me and you and me and my neighbour aren't trying to kill each other is fucking outrageous. It's such a... It's it's beautiful. It's a fucking mm. miracle to the point where I believe in God. Like, mm. I, I really think it's just wonderful how far humans have come. And I think in a thousand years, that's really where we need to be heading. Everybody needs to be treating their neighbours the way my grandma treats me but my nan loves me unconditionally so if she says something raises not that i'm gonna go oh okay she was in different times i might try and explain it to her gently and if she still doesn't go that's my fucking nan that's the <laughs> woman who fucking put food on my table since i was a kid yeah yeah well, i don't know so... my nan and i just see her say fuck pakistanis on facebook oh, God. and be like hey hey leave the pakistanis alone yada 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 but you see the opinion before you see the human being and if me and you have this conversation, okay, we've connected on a lot of topics, yada, yada, yada. We don't see each other, but we can sort of tell from our conversation that, that we're both on a very similar wavelength. Yeah. But if we were to have this discussion in a pub, we would be seeing facial expressions mm. and all that kind of stuff you just mentioned. And if you say opinion I disagree with, I'm going to go, well, do you know what? I disagree with that. Here's why. We you know what, Rob, we've got on. This conversation has been done in full good faith. I let you have it, whatever, man. We can agree to disagree. But that doesn't exist on Facebook because you see the opinion, you don't see the human being, and you don't see their face. So these emotional, emotive discussions we have mm. aren't done in the emotional, emotive context in which they should be done. Mm. Yeah, it's true. It's true, but I'm fucking hell, this is an it. Very this... inhuman, essentially. You're, you're having human discussions on a robot, robotic platform. This is a social network run by antisocial people. And it says something that that it, it taps into because, it, you know, you do occasionally see online someone try to be sort of the the reasonable, the taking both sides into consideration. And it, it just it doesn't get traction, does it? So it says something to the way we're wired that we do seek out the some group kind of extreme uh, group confirmation, selective bias or whatever the fuck it's called. Something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, and also, uh, I mean, I'm like that. I'm that middle ground guy. I was, and I said this in my show last year, All My Heroes Are Dead In Jail, of such a few nine. Like, nuance doesn't sell. Like, the whole point of the show is I literally, I said so many jokes and so many different things that were quite offensive. And the revelation is actually I've done something quite bad. Um, and the whole point is like one of the jokes, like one of the lines is give Hitler a break. The whole point <laughs> is I'm trying to get myself cancelled because I know that will like spur on my career. <laughs> um, that is a selling point now. If I got cancelled, I wouldn't have to have had to have moved back home with my parents. My career would have probably been corona-proof. The money would have been rolling. In. Um, you can joke about whatever you like these days. You just got to do it well enough. And if you don't, fucking all the power to you. That's going to be some fucking money, big man. Um, but 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 um, yeah 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 yeah. I, I see I see exactly what you're saying. And I think I think within within the context of comedy that that makes sense to me because. We're telling jokes, and if you're telling jokes, a lot of the time you you want the thing you're saying to not have been seen before by the audience. That you don't want them to arrive at the end of the thought before you do, because then they're not going to laugh. So sometimes coming out with some kind of outrageous statement, but is 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 more effective. But but the the reason behind doing it is to make people laugh, or to make people think, or to make people consider. So it, it at its heart, it's an artistic. Um, beneficial benevolent uh endeavor in that way as opposed to just spewing hate online or, or attacking people or, or doxing people all of the one, go on 100 percent um sorry i cut you off there no, but like i think you're 100 percent right and what i would add to this i think like online has really been 
I mean, it's been good in certain senses. I think it's wonderful that people like Rob Mulholland, uh, Adam Rowe, whoever can set up these, Andrew shows. I would never have discovered him without online. They can set up these podcasts and find their audience and blow up. And, you know, Andrew shows got rejected by all the big companies. And I just mm. think he's a fucking real artist that is hot. So I think it's wonderful that he's managed to use these tools to get there. But I think online has ruined it in a certain sense, particularly in British comedy where like, Comedy for me was about mixing with different groups. It mm. was about going to places I would never ever do. Ah, fucking Wigan was not on my fucking bucket list. <laughs> Rome in Somerset was not on my fucking bucket list. Neither was Newark. Neither was any of these places I've been. But going to these places and meeting people I, I don't know in communities that I wouldn't perhaps engage with, I fucking love that about comedy. That for me is central to life. Um, Absolutely. And like, whether it be like, a working class white community that perhaps harbors some racist and uh, racist views and I've won them over, uh, or, or it'd be like a fucking community of like trans people and fucking MBs that I would never have probably engaged with, uh, outside of comedy. I fucking love that. I love meeting new people, hearing their new stories and, and seeing how they live their life and shit. That for me is the dream of this job. But that doesn't really sell online. Online, you got to find your audience and you're not going to piss them off. You've got to tell them exactly what they want to hear. Mm. And I think comedy, Gavin Humphreys of Punch Drunk, he defined comedy to me uh, as perfectly as I've ever heard anyone define comedy. It's the art of sincerity. Mm. And on top of that, I think I've built this sort of subheading that I think comedy is half narcissism and half empathy. It's half narcissism because... What are you doing? What do you fucking do? Like, look, if you think in a planet of 7 billion people, your voice matters. That is a narcissistic, that is a narcissistic choice. They even like arrive at that conclusion subconsciously. Like, if you try to tell my fucking grandma what I do, it's just fucking baffled. She's not, not know how I arrived at that conclusion or how you could even do that as a job. Same with my parents. You know, I'm very, very, very fortunate to have even been able to consider it. But it's half empathy because I still got to go walk in a room of 300 people, feel what they feel and sort of appeal to them mm. uh, while still maintaining that sense of my own humanity and that sense of my own soul. But I've got to appeal to their souls and their stories while staying true to my soul and my story. And that is the science to the art of stand-up comedy. And that is what makes it a beautiful art form. And the best live comics, even the ones that come through online, Mo Gilligan, Paul Smith, all these people, they could do that and beautiful it's fucking wonderful and it's amazing and these are the true comics but i think nowadays what you're seeing more and more is people are trying to build their audience and we're all this capitalist rat race where we now we're at the bottom of the sunken zone and we all climb over each other to get to the top and now instead of doing that and instead of going on the circuit and meeting all these different people and working on their craft people have found it easier just to bypass all that go for youtube and either become a nazi vlogger or even on the left cry racism and sexism it's fucking easier to get attention and get good work by doing that sometimes than it is traveling on these mega buses overnight, fucking no money <laughs> and learning your craft and getting on and off. And I think that's truly just a very, for me, it's upsetting. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's sad in the words of Donald Trump. I can't <laughs> say sad anymore without fucking, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> I know it's crazy how he could fucking co colonialize that one word that's mm -hmm. been around for however many thousands of years, suddenly it's just him in his stupid voice saying it. I know, ridiculous. I think there's um, there's a lot of great points that you've just raised there. Um, but there will always be, with, with any kind of artistic endeavour, there will always be the people who are just in it for the art, won't there? So it won't it won't disappear entirely. It will it will yeah, morph and mutate. I really do see them. And I'm very lucky to be up north where I am because there are some beautiful representatives of that lee kyle gavin webster sammy dobson zoe a lot of the northeast city they just want to do what they want to do mm. uh, and they're very fucking good at it these are people i consider role models and idols and i've taken a lot of inspiration from and i'm immensely lucky immensely lucky privileged to have worked with these people and worked under them and watched them work because these are the people who i perhaps picked up my inspiration and my ideals from and you really see it, man. Lee Kyle is almost Buddhist in his approach. He's got this Zen mastery that is wonderful. Uh, he just likes doing comedy, doesn't care where it is. He's genius. Absolutely. He's got some of the best jokes I've ever heard. And like one of them was, for example, like, you know, people think, you know, it's, it's not great because I'm a comedian. Now I quite break it and I, I'm not making a lot of money. I live in a council house in South Shields. But like when I was younger, 
I thought I was going to be homeless. So like, <laughs> this is the dream for me. I mean, look, <laughs> I'm in a room. <laughs> I'm in a room that stays with me forever. But these people are true comics in all senses of the word. Uh, I highly recommend you go check them out. Lee's got a YouTube channel, uh, Gavin Webster. Uh, he has his special and his sitcom on Vimeo. Um, I've, I've not watched his special yet. Watch his sitcom, it's very good. I, I recommend it. But his special is called um, I'm Gavin Webster. Buy some shares in me or buy some shares in Gavin Webster. It's on Vimeo. And his stand up is for me next to none. And uh, you don't take it just from me. He was voted Comedian's Comedian of the Year in 2015 or 16. And if the entire circuit are saying you're mm. the best, you're the best we have, you're the number one, I think that speaks far louder in volume than anything I can say about the legend that is Gavin Webster. Well, that is, um, that's very magnanimous of you to, uh, to say that and to plug uh, another comedian's special on the show. But you know what? Why don't you plug your own? Because... Um, I watched it, at least I think one of them, the other day, um, Newcastle Brown Tales Part 1. Uh, ah, which with is, Paul Gaz going. Which, which has Gazza, yeah. So what is he Dream doing there? What is going on? I mean, it's amazing. And he tells the Raoul Moat story. and it's, I mean, it's astonishing. Did you know he was going to be there when you started filming? I'll tell you the story, man. I'm going to record a, a vlog and put this online. Um, and put it on my uh, Patreon and use that to try and encourage people to, to sign up and stuff. And I'm going to clip the, the whole special into clips and put the clips on Insta again right. to generate that. I've just been very busy with a variety of things. I don't understand, man. Fucking all my work has ended and yet I'm still busy with so many things. <laughs> the only thing that has changed is I'm making no fucking money anymore. Um, <laughs> so what happened there was it was a very awkward scenario, but fucking it's funny. Um, uh, so what happened was, was uh, my sister is conventionally a very attractive woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not one of the fucking weirdos that is incestual. Just I had to fight a lot of kids in school. I went to a private school, so it was quite easy. I beat up a lot of kids <laughs> who said, my sister, oh, hey, Israel, your sister's really fit. Um, she has fucking more Instagram followers than me. I've been working on art my whole life. I've got something like 2,000. She's got 50,000 just off being pretty. <laughs> And one day, I mean, we used to live, she lives in Dubai now, but one day we lived in, uh, we lived in, we lived in a, a house together. Well, no, she lived here. I think I lived in London or Manchester or something, you know. But um, what, what happened was, was uh, I was obviously back for the show and I was staying here and I was getting ready. I was memorizing my lines. And she told me that a couple of days before, like, you know, a lot of men pop up in her DMs. And who's still into her fucking DMs but gas? Oh, my God. <laughs> No, she told me she wasn't interested, and they struck up a friendship. Um, well, a friendship on my sister's part. Right. I guess I had other ideas. That's a bit one-sided, that one, yeah. <laughs> and he asked her what she was doing that night, and she's like, my brother's doing a show at Stan. He's a stand-up comedian. I'm going to see him. Now, at this point, I already did the Raul Moat joke, the Gaza joke. So, like... You know, that had to be done, obviously. Of do you course. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and she's like, Raul, I'm really sorry. I think I'm sorry. It might be benefit. I don't know. Gaza <laughs> has invited himself to this show. Do you want to, do you want him to come? And at first I'm like, what the f- what? No, I don't, where? Eh, what? I'm not sure. Do I want somebody who clearly needs a lot of help, uh, and is perhaps struggling with his mental health up my, sh- comedy show and I was like that would be sort of it would be a story I don't know what to do I was like look fucking you, I don't know you decide um, if you're genuinely reaching out to him as a friend and you can help him fucking why not um, and she's like okay fuck it I think it'd be good for him instead of sitting in his hotel room yeah. come out meet people etc etc and he came in the car he was fucking shit faced man god mm-hmm. that guy needs serious uh, help with alcoholism I think he was shit faced or maybe he just drank so much in the past that his brain is permanently shit faced yeah hard I don't to know. tell because he didn't drink with us one bit we kept him off it all the time and he got in the car so me my mum my sister and poor Gasgoyne are driving to the fucking gig <laughs> fucking weirdest gig share of fucking car share I've ever been in, <laughs> in my life uh, and Gaz is just sort of relentless man he's just kind of being sleazy and this kind of stuff I'm not going to tell you the exact thing he said to me because uh, with the utmost respect, I'm going to keep that for my own Patreon channel. That makes it. sense. Yeah, uh, 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 and also, I just kind of don't want to say it because 
on my Patreon, you got to pay two pound to access the story. Um, in public, you know, I don't want to drop the guy in shit. He's a good guy, um, and he needs help. Uh, yeah. And criminalizing him and holding him up for ridicule, or you know, the left will probably be like, ah, racist, sexist, piece of shit, or whatever. And I just ain't gonna do that. I don't believe in snitching like that. I mm. believe in forgiveness. I believe in helping your fellow human um, in that regard. And I just, I don't want to, I don't want to fucking, you know, hold him up for. I don't want to hold him up to, you know, for trouble like that. I don't want to drag trouble no, of course to the door in that regard. No, no. And I mean, he actually, you know, he, he kind of joins in a bit in the special and, um, and he's you funny, the, you know. I'm going to cut the crowd work I did as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... And I did 15 minutes of crowd work before that show and the 15 minutes of crowd work he gets involved as well and it's fucking hilarious. He is, he um, is quick, even with whatever problems no, he, he is, he is dialed he said, in. They say genocide. Genocide? What the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> they say genius, genius and insanity. God, that went horribly wrong. Damn, you can tell I'm not even. They say genius and insanity are two sides of the same coin, and that guy defines it. He defines it. He's a genius. He's a genius. He's a legend, and he's a genius. But anyway, he's in the car, hitting on my sister. My mom's not too keen on him. <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck is my life? <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> we got. Yeah, we, we drive to the gig uh, and he sits my sister very politely through the whole thing. He engages. He's very funny. He's funnier than me, unfortunately. Uh, he drinks his J2Os um, and he has a laugh. But, and then something happens at the end of the show, which is really, really funny, regarded, related to the very first thing he says to me. Yeah, he tells his own joke. He's a comedian himself. Yeah. It's very funny, but I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to save that for my Patreon. Well, I, I will, I'll provide links to all those things in the show notes so people can uh, can go and find um, go and find that story for themselves. And uh, and I'll, yeah. I'll link to your special as well because it's absolutely brilliant. And, oh, thank uh, you very much, man. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's a better special coming out. I need to edit it, but I've also got to talk with a production company who might want to do something with it, so I might not put it on my YouTube. We'll see what advance they af- offer me. But... Um, that, that's all my heroes are dead in jail I touch up your nan and if you enjoyed your Castle Brown Tales <laughs> damn uh, given what we talked about so far you'll really enjoy all my heroes uh, I think really prefer that and that's uh, yeah that's got the creditos behind it man it was uh, nominated by Leicester Comedy Festival for the best show nice and it also was called by the Scotsman Superb Political Comedy and superb political commentary. Uh, that was Kate Copstick, and you know how hard that bitch can be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Broadway baby, pretty much. It, it, it read like a five, but they gave it four. Right. Uh, but really, I think that one's special, and I think that one touches at the heart of a lot of the things we've been talking about very comedically, and it's probably the proudest the thing I'm most proud about in my entire life. Nice. Well, I mean, the, the one thing I would say is make sure that you, uh, if it, you write the subtitles yourself because I had closed captions on, on the link. And um, let's just say they don't know how to t- translate Geordie. Because... Yeah, did you understand me well or not? Do you think I need subtitles? Because the thing is, I did subtitle what Gaza said. Yeah, no, no, no. I didn't. I didn't think you needed subtitles. I understood what you're saying. What, where I got confused is because I accidentally had subtitles just clicked on, and it's the auto-generated one. So it's it's you talking, and I'm like, I know what he's saying, but under here, it's just a, a barrage of nonsense. There are two things that really because frust fucking subtitling takes a long time. Yeah. For our special, I just wasn't sure if I was willing to do that. Um, I do it for the clips I've got online. Yeah. I do it for when the crowd respond. Um, maybe I should do it for... Spe- I think I was going to do it for Heroes anyway, just because I really wanted people to understand what I was fucking saying there, uh, even if it took me fucking two days or whatever. But it, it just takes so long. And one thing I'm having a problem with I need to look into is it's fine on Facebook, you can just put the video subtitled on, but on YouTube, what I try to do on some of the clips is I try to you know put the non subtitle clip up and then put the SRT file that I've made on, but it never fucking registers properly on YouTube. Mm. It's really annoying. I mean, you could try, uh, what's that website? Fiverr. I'm sure people will be willing to write up your subtitles for a few quid. Uh, nothing that's going to break the bank. But um, yeah, no, no. I think obviously the stuff where uh, where it was off mic or you're interacting with Gazza, I, it definitely made sense to have to have it written yeah. out. Um yeah. That's how he sounds. How dare you say that about my mother? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in in drawing things to uh, to a close here, um, it's been uh, it's been great to to have you on the show and get to know you. I feel like we've got 
a lot in common. This has been great. Um, would you yeah, would you well, come yeah, back? Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Um, would Would you come back on the show at some point? Maybe yeah, when you've got your sure, new. Man. You know how lonely I fucking am. I'm living with <laughs> fucking vulnerable people. I'll never go out of the fucking house no more. I'm fucking got no friends. <laughs> and I'm just looking for someone to talk to. <laughs> In the abyss is a very, very uh, worthwhile title. Well, exactly, exactly. Do you have a message of hope for anyone listening out there? Something to, uh, something to feel good about in this moment. Ah, uh, yeah, actually, um, two things. I think if you're a humanist, for us as humans, it might not be the best, but I think humans always prevail. I think Europe and Canada will ride through, and I think even if we don't, even if there's some big world war, look, we survived World War Two as a species. Somebody, some sort of fragment of you if you're a humanist or an atheist will exist whether that be your niece or your nephew or your kid and even if not some human you touched you had a conversation with who had a conversation with someone else they will come through this Hmm. they will come through this and they will learn their lessons for the better Hmm. and society and humanity will improve after whatever may come there is always hope in these dark days um and if you're not if you're religious like me if you're a hindu Reincarnation, bro. <laughs> fucking attorney at our disposal. And we get to live through the war and fucking grow up through it. So you'd be fucking tough as shit. You'd be like fucking Terminator running through that bitch, shooting up fucking Nazis or robot Nazis or whatever the fuck we're fighting. And you come out of that fight. And then even if you get shot in the war, fuck it. You got the next life and the next life and the next life. And you get to go through this brilliant roller coaster over and over. So whether you're an atheist, a heathen, or, or whether you're a godly man like myself, there is hope, man. There's always hope. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Raul. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, give it up, if you will. Thank you very much, Raul, okay? Take care, mate. Thanks Thank for you very on. much for having me, man. Please uh, promote my uh, my Patreon, yep. my Kofi page. It's all Raul Coley, R-A-U-L, K-O-H-L-I, Kofi.com slash Raul Coley, uh, Patreon.com slash Raul Coley, uh, my YouTube channel, please subscribe to that. All my social media is a Raul Coley comic, and not R-A-H-U-L, but not Rahul Kohli. That's the guy in Philly Manor and fucking all the Netflix things. I zombie. Uh, please, please, please don't fucking follow his shit or give him money. Give me <laughs> fucking money. Please. Also, uh, if you are into Hinduism or you're into spirituality or you're into uh, defining shit, uh, do you do know I've got a podcast on BBC Sounds? Ah. No, go ahead. Plug it. Sanskrit. It's about Hinduism. Uh, and it's just me, basically, last year, I've been raised Hindu, but me and a lot of people it's the third most popular religion in the world we don't know anything about hinduism mm. we know reincarnation we know elephants so it's me trying to figure out the tenets <laughs> but i really think you love it the first episode is about inner peace spirituality yoga that kind of stuff the second episode is about uh, 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 gender the third episode is about cannabis which is big in the hindu religion mm-hmm. there's one about eating meat and vegetarianism because uh you know it's all stuff the west has copied uh, you know weeds getting legalized in a lot of places gender is a big discussion um uh, sexuality is a big discussion. Mm. Uh, yoga, meditation, that's big on Western high streets now. Cannabis is getting legalized all over. And the final episode is about atheism and how Hindus founded the first school of atheism. Mm. Um, and it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting podcast, man. I think you particularly would love it. It's probably the proudest thing I've produced second to all my heroes. Uh, and I think if your listeners enjoyed the topics we were discussing today and enjoyed my last message, I hope really go check that out on comic, on BBC Sounds or on Spotify or on iTunes, it's on uh, Apple Music, sorry, it's on all of the uh, all of the platforms, six 30-minute episodes, uh, and I think it's a really great podcast that you would enjoy. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, fantastic. Um, I, I'll po- post links to all of that, all of that, lots of stuff there. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much, dude. Um, yeah, let's thank chat again much, soon. Rob. All right, you take too, care, man. Safe journey. Have a nice day. Nice one. You too. You too. Yeah, and I'll stop that recording there. Um, that was good. Yeah, man, I enjoyed it. Yeah, that was a uh, yeah wide ranging chat with all kinds of stuff going on there, eh? It was um, really Barely interesting. On comedy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I thought we were only going to chat for sort of forty five minutes, but we've gone uh, over an hour and a half just just nattering away. So that's uh, yeah, that's great. Lots of stuff there. I- Lies when you're having fun. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, all right, I'm going to head off. Uh, if you have any oh, sort man, of... Um, grab some fucking food. Yeah, I know. If you get any sort of tingle in your belly about something that we said, I probably won't be posting this until Monday, so you've got time to message me. But um, I think we're probably on. that now.
<laughs> with what's going to be left of the live circuit when it comes back, I'm fine making some enemies if I did offend anyone. <laughs> uh, but I don't think I have. No, I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, All right. Good, man. Thanks for having me. Nice Cheers one. Too, yeah, dude. Bye. Chat to you later. The Bliss of the Abyss. Roll Coley there. Um, well, uh, that was uh, that was an excellent um, chat. And um, if you enjoyed what we had to say there, I'm going to post links to all of his stuff um, in the show notes. Uh, please do support um, artists in this time if you at all can. Obviously, if you can't, make sense. But if you can't financially, please again like subscribe give some stars hey don't be don't be jealous or stingy with your stars hand them out um and uh thank you once again for listening to another episode of the bliss of the abyss thank you for listening to the show this has been the bliss of the abyss with your host me robin Emma jones ruskin denmark whatever you want to call me if you've enjoyed the show please consider supporting it by becoming a patron go to patreon.com slash the bliss of the abyss and give whatever you can it really really helps support the show and keeps it growing and becoming better and bigger and brighter Follow us on all the social medias. Follow me on all the social medias and give us five stars. It helps grow the show. Keep coming back every week for more Bliss of the Abyss.